In this episode of Mike Plays RP1, we're going to be taking a look at this little prop trainer I built for my budding Kerbinauts so that they can get in a little flight time. This plane is completely built from the starting parts, and although it has no contracts it can complete at this time, it will give us an opportunity to explore how to build and fly a basic plane in RP1. I'll also take a brief look at the Atmosphere Autopilot mod that is here to assist us in our flying. Let's get started. I actually did this build back in day one of this campaign, right after I designed the WAC Corporal sounding rocket that was featured in the first episode. I just couldn't handle nothing going on in the hangar. So let's enter into said hangar, but before we get started with the prop plane, I want to point out that there is a pre-built, perfectly serviceable jet trainer, also built completely from the starting parts, that you can just straight up use. Now I mentioned in the first episode that to get started, you need to pick at most two of the three programs offered in the administrative building. That's what determines the funding and the contracts that you get. And although I did not pick the X-Plane program, that doesn't mean I can't put some pilots in some planes and fly anyway. In fact, there are rewards for completing crude milestone contracts like this 15 kilometer altitude record and this 600 meter per second speed record. Although the pre-built jet trainer can't break the sound barrier, it can comfortably cruise at a 15 kilometer altitude. Unfortunately, my prop plane can't do this. Rather makes me wonder whether starting with a prop plane was a mistake. You see, the main thing I used this trainer for was to take it apart and learn how it was constructed so I could apply it to my own plane. That said, building my own jet is probably a good idea too. Something for a future episode because right now it's time to get started with my plane build. One of the reasons I'm building a prop plane is to show you how easy using these engines are, especially when compared to trying to build a prop engine using the robotic parts that come with the Breaking Ground DLC in stock. There are several here to pick from, but I'm going to go with the more modest I-0550-B piston engine. Just like with the rocket engines, these are modeled after real world engines. So to get me started, I looked up this engine and scrolled through some of the planes that have used it, finding the Cessna 182 Skylane, which first flew in 1955 and is still being produced today. Because of the more realistic aerodynamics and parts included in RP-1, building a rough replica of this should go a long way to producing a plane that will work for me. I started with the Bonanza cabin, which can hold up to six Kerbals. Some things to note about these early cockpits and cabins is that they all say in bright red, this part doesn't allow EVA. But if you scroll down the details, you will find a clarification that you can still exit when landed on Earth or flying below a 20 kilometer altitude. So you can exit on the ground or bail from the plane if it isn't too crazy high up. And speaking of crazy high up, it is also important to note that all of these cockpits and cabins are unpressurized and will lead to death above an altitude of 16 kilometers. That said, you will get warned about this in flight with the message, cockpit is above the safe altitude, which will lead to crew incapacitation and eventual death at which point you just have to drop back below 16 kilometers. So if you had the idea of sticking one of these on top of a rocket booster and firing a Kerbal into space, you're going to need to put that idea aside. All we gotta do is plunk our engine at the front of the cabin. The air intakes are built in. As well, the engine generates electricity and the cabin already has a healthy battery supply so we don't have to worry about that and it's on to building a fuselage. Under structure, we'll find a procedural structure part. Like the tanks I used last episode, you can change the size and shape of this part. I will do my best to shape it like the Cessna 182 I'm modeling. The key here was using the offset to bend the part upwards a bit. Just rotate the part if the offset is in the wrong direction. Next came a pair of procedural wings, the exact same part that was used for the fins on my sounding rocket. I'll move them to the top of the plane, and while hovering over the part, press J to bring up the shape changing controls. Of course, I spent a lot of time tweaking this, and I'll make sure to show you these shape values on the final product. 
Like real planes, you can use wings to store fuel. Just like with the tanks, there is a fill button to put in the fuel that matches the engine that you have installed, which in this case is just aviation gasoline. Right now, only 1% of the wing volume is for fuel storage. To change that, just pull up the utilization slider. I put it at 10% which gave me over 17 kilometers per second of delta V which feels like it should be more than adequate. Putting fuel into the wings is helpful as it automatically puts the center of fuel mass close to the center of lift which will make keeping the plane balanced easier. Now these wings do not have control surfaces built in, we still need to add them. To give them a surface to attach to, I changed the trailing edge on the wing to no edge. I then grabbed a B9 procedural control surface and put a pair of them onto the wings. Again, expect to spend some time playing with the shape of these. My goal was to blend them into the wing and to have them just under half the length of the wing. I then copied and pasted what I made for a second pair of control surfaces, which also have to be tweaked because the wing is thicker here. The idea is for the outer controls to be ailerons to control roll, while the inner ones will be flaps. This still left an ugly gap in the middle, so I copied the control surface one more time and adjusted the size, shape and position to fill in this space. How much tweaking you want to do is up to you, but I think it's clear you can spend a lot of time making this pretty. On to configuring the control surfaces. The interface is a little different from the stock one, but the idea is the same, though it does give you more options. The outer ailerons are for roll, so I click standard controls and turn the pitch and yaw to zero, which is in the middle of the bar, don't make them negative or you will have them flapping in the wrong way. The inner control surfaces are flaps, so I click flaps spoiler. If you activate spoiler, these get toggled to the brake key, which is what I'm going to use because I've yet to discover what flap is toggled with. If you happen to know, please let me know in the comments. And finally, I don't want these little guys in the middle to do anything, so I click standard control and set pitch, yaw and roll to zero. And just to make sure I have this all right, I did a quick simulation and tried out each of the controls I've thus far set up. And I discovered that I forgot to turn off the yaw, pitch and roll with the flaps. Yep, test as you go, always a good policy. Again, when you end a simulation, don't revert through the stock menu. Instead, bring up the KCT menu and end the simulation. Once back in the hangar, I made sure to replicate the changes I made before moving on to the tail. And as the elevators and rudder are constructed out of the same parts as the wings, I'm going to spend less time explaining this part. For now, I'm just trying to replicate as closely as I can the shape that these surfaces have on the actual plane. And then to adjust the control surfaces so that they fit onto the structural surfaces cleanly. Needless to say, there will be a substantial amount of test flying to tweak and balance all of these parts. Of course, I also tweaked the control so that the elevators just looked after pitch while the rudder was in control of yaw. This was followed by another quick simulation to make sure that all the control surfaces work in the way in which they are intended. Next came the landing gear, and although I do have available both the small and medium retractable landing gear, I decided to be brave and go with the fixed landing gear as that is what the original plane had. I turned up the spring rating and damp ratio to full, but also thanks to the tweak scale mod, you can increase the size and strength of these. I decided to go up one size to the 1.25 scale, hoping this will make them a little bit stronger. Just like with a stock plane, you want the rear gear just a little bit behind the center of mass of the plane. I moved the forward gear as far down as I could without it separating from the engine cowling, turned the brakes limit to zero, and then adjusted the height of the rear gear so that the plane will sit pitched up just a little bit when it's sitting on the runway. As with most planes, you want the center of lift just a little bit behind the center of mass. Besides moving the lifting surfaces forward and back, don't forget that changing their shape will also move the centers of mass and lift around. For example, I could have these wings less swept back to move the center of lift forward, or increase the size of the elevators to move the center of lift back. 
Then comes the fun job of changing textures and painting to get the thing to look better. RP1 also comes with some nice decals that you can use to further customize your plane. Finally, adding a pair of struts from the cabin to the wingtips completed the look I was going for. And I think it goes without saying that this didn't come without a whole lot of test flying and further tweaks. I tried to be a little abusive during this, but found the wings were pretty sturdy. So to save a little bit of mass, I turned the mass strength multiplier down to 0.15%. Though I did find that, on that setting, pulling out of high speed dies was not a good idea. A little earlier I promised to show you all the shape numbers in the final build, so I'm doing that here. If you want, you can pause the video and use these, but I'm no longer convinced that will be particularly helpful. I foolishly forgot to record my original build. What you just saw was me recreating the building and testing that I did, but even with the actual final plane in front of me, I found it difficult to reproduce it exactly. With everything that can be tweaked, builds take on a more organic texture in RP1, and you may be better off, once you understand the principles involved, to build, test, tweak, and iterate yourself, rather than to expect to duplicate. I'm curious as to your experience though, so let me know in the comments what you think. Either way, although the design of this plane is done, we still have to give it to Kerbal Construction Time. You saw in the last episode that I originally assigned five engineers to this project, but once the launch complex was done, I reassigned one of those engineers to the construction of the WAC Corporal sounding rocket from last episode. The remaining four then took another two and a half months to complete the construction. Okay, so it's built, and under the combine, there it is, it's ready for launch. And this is where I discovered that, although you have Kerbals available for simulation, I guess those are simulated Kerbals. I need to hire me some pilots. They're five grand each. I'm hoping I can afford this because I suspect they have a salary too, but I'm going to pick two. First, here is Kenneth Taylor. Notice here it says Kenneth Taylor will retire no earlier than May 11th, 1957. That's about six years from now. Retirement will be delayed the more interesting training they undergo and flights they fly. Well, hopefully he'll find our little Cessna interesting. For our second pilot, I'm going to pick Evelyn Wolf down here at the bottom, who is also set to retire in about six years, but hopefully we'll be able to push that back some. And now if I go to launch my little prop trainer, I can, oh, I can provide them with chutes, include a parachute. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And they have already been put into the Bonanza cabin, so we will launch. Now these wheels are wacky. I could not figure out how to get them not to be wacky. They seem to click into the uh, ground there a little bit. So I find I gotta get up, but if I hit the brakes, they kind of unwhack. At least they stop their ridiculous spinning. And we'll just fly around the KSC a little bit. Give Kenneth and Evelyn a little bit of a whoa. Yeah, it's a nice little flyer. Remember that there are no contracts I can complete with this plane. Consider it more an exercise before moving on to bigger things. You also may be noticing that only Kenneth is showing up at the bottom right, but if we check the crew vital section of the Kerbalism window, we can see that Evelyn is indeed aboard. There's just something up with the IVA of this cabin. Okay, let's talk about the Atmosphere Autopilot mod. To access it, find the double A on the menu bar and click Autopilot Module Manager. To get going, click Craft Settings. There's a fair bit here, but what I want to take a look at is cruise flight control, so I'll open up its GUI. I can now get rid of the craft settings window, I don't need that. So right now we're heading close to due north, so let's change our heading to 345 degrees. To do that, enter 345 for the desired course and activate the heading button. To get the flight controller to take over, you need to then put on the master switch. 
we'll get it to control our altitude too by turning on vertical motion as well. It's currently set for a thousand meters, that's fine. Doesn't seem to be taking over. Oh yeah, I got to also select the cruise flight controller. There we go. Alright, so let's change our heading now to 330 degrees. Whoa, that is aggressive. Wonder if I should change these authority limiters a bit. Uh, maybe something for later. Okay, let's see what kind of altitude we can reach. So right now we're at a kilometer, we're at full throttle. Let's put it up to two. Oh, that is very aggressive. Advanced options. Max climb rate 15. There are a number of advanced options to tweak here, but the one I find the most useful is the max climb rate, which is the one I just used there. Anyway, Kenneth and Evelyn cruised around for a little bit, and I got the plane up to an altitude of 3 kilometers. Though I'm sure it could go higher, I think it's time to bring it home. Yeah, so I'm pretty much ready. I think I'm going to take it off the autopilot. All you got to do is take off the master switch. And make sure put SAS back on and you are back in control. Okay, so flaps deployed. I can see my shadow. Now nice and slow. These wheels, you definitely don't want to have too much speed when you touch. <laughs> A little bounce. There we go. Brakes on. We're down. Oh, they don't even look stupid this time. Yeah, I did put up the spring ratio and dampening. So, oh, now they go. They're clicking into the ground a bit. <laughs> oh, brakes. Yeah. Oh, I do have the brakes on. Hopefully this will stop before we're at the end of the runway. Oh, dear. <laughs> I think we're gonna, yeah. We're good. <laughs> At this point, I decided to EVA Kenneth. First, to show you that you can EVA Kerbals from these cockpits, despite what the red text in the part description says. And second, I wanted to show that there is no science here to collect. As far as I can tell, all the Earth surface and low atmosphere science has been removed. Unfortunately, I didn't think about the cabin re-entry in this design. Kevin gave it the college try, but after the physics went a little funky, I decided to just recover. Unfortunately, I recovered using the stock tools, which had me lose the plane and be forced to rebuild it. I should have recovered through Kerbal construction time. Thankfully, I had performed my customary quick save just before landing, which allowed me to revert, land again, and recover the right way. That way being to open KCT and select Recover Active Vessel to Warehouse. It will be a couple of days before the plane is ready to fly again, but that certainly beats the months it would have taken to rebuild it. In addition, Kenneth and Evelyn's flight pushed back the retirement dates by 46 days. Although I suspect I'll be running into some diminishing returns with this, it definitely seems worthwhile to keep these folks flying for now. We'll certainly be seeing them again fairly soon. But before that happens, I want to point out that my launch complex is undergoing a renovation that will be done in another six days. This is to facilitate the construction and launch of a new rocket that I hope will become my first object to cross the Kármán line and enter space. That is going to be the topic for the next episode, and I hope to see you then.